we're going to have a conversation here with a few questions. I have about three questions in mind, conveniently, one inspired by each of you. So, um, but we'd love to hear from all of you on this. And then we'll open the floor up to questions from all of you. Um, Wendy, I liked your mention of don't think of yourself for the younger people in the audience as being me now, but think of yourself as being me when I was in high school or when I was in fourth grade or when I was in seventh grade, wherever you were. Um, so I think it'd be very interesting to hear because all of us have a different journey as to when we got interested. Angela, you mentioned you started in physics and then the universe turned you on. Um, so I'd love to hear each of you speak to when did you get interested in this line of work. Tell us a little bit about your start story. So it wasn't a straight line and I only understand it in retrospect. Mm -hmm. um, but my first memory of, of interest in astronomy was when I was about seven years old and uh, my father, we, we, our family had rented a cottage north of Toronto. I grew up in Canada and it was the first time I'd ever seen a really dark sky and and my father was explaining to me that, that the light that had left the stars that we were looking at had left um, years ago and maybe hundreds of years ago maybe thousands of years ago and so the, the stars that we were looking at might not be there anymore because we wouldn't know that they had disappeared it would, we would have to wait that amount of time for light to get to us to realize that the stars had disappeared and i just remember looking up at that sky that dark sky and it just it blew my mind literally um and that feeling never left me ever um in high school, I decided that I was interested in science. It never occurred to me to become an astronomer. I didn't know any astronomers. I read textbooks that had lots of things about astronomers. They didn't look like me. They, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know you could get paid to do this. I'm serious. <laughs> I had no idea. And, and so it wasn't until... The first women didn't get paid. That's right. Yes. <laughs> That's very <really> true. <laughs> That's another sad story. But we but do now. We do now. <laughs> we do now. And, um, and I decided that I, I was interested in biology, I was interested in physics, so I didn't start in astrophysics either. But when I got to university and I took an astronomy course, I realized, oh my goodness, this is really what I love to do, and, and I never looked back. So that's my story. Thank you. Angela. So I started trying to understand humans, and they're very complicated. <laughs> and <laughs> physics is so much easier, believe me. Those of you who like physics, you probably agree with me, right? I mean, you just write four equations down and then the rest is just math, right? Um, you know, only four forces. So for me, uh, people were very complicated when I was in high school. And I thought physics was such an easy, I see some <laughs> people nodding, such an easy thing in comparison. And, and it works every time. And it works here, it works in Japan, it works everywhere. So I really love that. Um, that's, you know, predictable, I can do it, and I got really excited. And then I realized that actually it was a good job because I met faculty members at the universities in Brazil, by the way, in Brazilian. Um, and I had a boyfriend and we decided we have to do our PhDs and then we'd be happy ever after. So we get married, we come to MIT, not a very good place to be happy ever after. But anyway, <laughs> and then we get divorced and then I am still here. So anyway, so this was uh, the beginning, which what I'm trying to say is that it wasn't very planned the way you know it, it worked out, but it worked out much better than planned. I'm very happy to be in the US and I really got in, engaged in the astrophysics side of physics at MIT because I was actually starting to be a particle physicist. You probably heard about the Higgs field that was the discovery a couple years ago. Everybody's excited about that. Uh, I was working on a different uh, accelerator called the SSC that the US was going to build and would be even better than the one that discovered the Higgs and then that got cancelled. And then I realized that you know astrophysics has so many questions. Um, while the one Higgs, you know, you have thousands of people to get that one Higgs. Well, for astrophysics, she can look one way, I can look another way, she can look another way. So it's much more fruitful place to do very creative work. And so it's been really a wonderful ride. So I'm very happy. But anyway, that's how I started. So listening to your stories, actually, I have a lot of parallels with Wendy. I had no clue. People did research. I had no clue what research was or what academia was. Um, but I liked from elementary school, people commented. They were telling me, oh, you're so good in math. So unusual. Um, um, so I started from liking math. Uh, thankfully, I had a very supportive father. Um, 
and I went through high school, fell in love with physics in high school, and entered physics studies in college. It was only in college that I discovered astronomy. And, and I used the word a lot, fell in love, because really, that's how it felt. And I had a boyfriend who became my husband, and then I divorced. But, <laughs> but, 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 but so I knew, I knew the human falling in love. But it's not but necessary. I'm still married to my husband. <laughs> Wendy and I are still married to our original husbands. Yeah. But but falling in love with astronomy was really it was an obsession for me in college. It was what I did in my free time, <laughs> um, while listening to music and drinking wine at the same time. I'm sorry. In, in college, I'm sorry. In Europe, we drink wine before 21. <laughs> Um, so I, it was only in college I realized about academia, what it was, that you can get paid. I remember that thought because my parents uh, could not have you know, supported me through PhD studies in Greece. You had to be supported by your parents at the time. So the US is where I could get money and go to the best universities in the world and do what I had fallen in love with. I mean, who can beat that? <laughs> That's great. Um, Angela, I loved your analogy of the piano. I have not heard that analogy before specifically, but what it sparked in my mind was um, knowing a little bit about some of your outside interests and how that may have inspired that analogy. So I want to next ask each of you to talk to us about what you do besides astronomy and astrophysics. What do you enjoy doing outside of physics? So I'll go first just to change things because she mentioned music and piano. So my daughter plays the piano. My husband. I finally got the right guy. Is a musician, <laughs> and he plays a classical Famous guitar. Famous musician. He's really yeah. good. Um, anyway, if you want to see him, he'll be playing at uh, in um, April seventeenth at the University of Chicago. Anyway, so uh, but the the thing about music is that uh, you know who doesn't like music, right? I haven't ruined anybody, and it's brilliant, and it brings you to places that. And, and one thing, just to be a geek for a second. I discovered that eyes see much less than the ear can hear, right? So it's, we can only see about one, actually even less than one octave in terms of the different light sh uh, you know, colors, the rainbow. The rainbow is very narrow. Uh, we can observe a lot more, but we can only see very, very narrow. But we can hear a huge amount, and dogs can hear more than us and so forth. So anyway, but music is definitely what I do when I'm not, uh, or budgie jumping, but my husband doesn't like me to do that anymore. <laughs> I also did some pair, uh, some skydiving. That was fun, but that was a phase of my life that's over now. <laughs> Walking is more like <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's it. Go ahead, Vicky. Well, um, I'm always embarrassed when I get this question because the truth is I don't do much. But <laughs> 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 it's my family. Tell us about my your great family. husband. <laughs> uh, my second husband. Um, uh, Vicky has a seven-year-old and a three-year-old, so I think yes. anyone with no, a seven-year-old. No, ten-year-old. Oh, he's ten. I, my apologies. Ten, ten and yes. three. Ten and going on to That's 15. a lot of time. A boy and a little girl. Um, so uh, it's very busy, and work absorbs a lot of time because I can do it anywhere I am, and I end up doing it anywhere <laughs> I am. Uh, but the things I do love actually uh, is traveling. I love watching movies. And when I used to have time, I used to read books, like one a day or something. But that doesn't happen recently much. I have a tip for you there, because I have an almost 10-year-old, and I've started reading books she recommends. And I can get them done in about a week or two, even though she can read them in a day. So I, I recommend you listen to the 10-year-olds. Wendy. Uh, so I also like to read, and uh, I have two children now. They're not children anymore. I have a 28-year-old daughter and a 27-year-old son. So I have the oldest kids here. Um, 30. 30, okay. And, and I, I think one of the things I realized is over time, you know, I used to read, I used to, but I read a lot more now that my kids are 28 and 27. And when I was leading this big project with Hubble, I, I don't think I, and my kids were young, I don't think I read a newspaper, I don't think I read a book, I don't think I saw a movie. Um, but you do what you love to do at the time, and so my family absorbed my time, and then when they grew up and they could read themselves, then I could read a little more. And, and so I think we all really love what we do, and sometimes people say, haven't you worked that much? But when you love it, it's not work. And we it's love work to the do. others, and they keep saying, my kids say, why is mommy always on her laptop? <laughs> 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 well, 
But um, I took up yoga about 10 years ago. I love to do yoga. And, and I felt that really helped me when I was, I was director of an observatory. I was chair of the board of this big international project. And we all did end up having to deal with people again. And my way to deal with it was to go to yoga. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. I think the, the thing I'd like to punctuate is these humble women who are in love with their work. Um, you also heard in there, though, they have families. They listen to music they do other things as well. And so this is a career, and you love this type of work as a career, but it does not mean that it's exclusive to having a life around your career. And so you're hearing that come out through all of them. And it's just so much a part of our lives that we don't even think to punctuate that. But it's a question I get a lot. Do you have to give up everything to be a scientist? You absolutely don't have to give up everything to be a scientist. You have a life. It's that you love the science. And so that's what you talk about all the time. And people think that because that's all you talk about, that's all you do. But we do do other things. OK, lastly, um, each of you touched on something that is so critical in science, and that's perseverance through either failures in terms of launch vehicles just going by the wayside, or in terms of the time you have to stick with something until it gets done. So I thought it would be um, great to end on just hearing your thoughts. Your, it's your choice if you want to give a specific example or just give us your thoughts around the value of perseverance and let everybody understand that these are failures as well as successes and that's part of the journey. Vicki, you want to start? I, yeah, definitely. Our I mean, my story includes failures and of course they stick in your mind like I'll never forget. But um, I'll mention maybe a couple of things very quickly. I, I went into college and, and within a month or so I had announced to my dad that I don't want to be a high school teacher, instead I want to do a PhD and become a university professor. And the first semester comes and in Greece your grade is all a final exam, there's no homework or anything. One day, one exam, that's your grade. And my first physics course, um, I got a 6 out of 10. <laughs> And it was a tough time. I had moved to a new city. I was away from my family. I wasn't very happy. I was struggling, etc. I didn't get a good grade. I remember telling my father on the phone, and, and he answers, and you want to do a PhD? I think you need to do a lot more studying. <laughs> so you know, that could have stopped me back then, but um, somehow I, I just didn't know what else to do. So I kept going, and it, it, it got much better. Uh, the second fail, oh, not failure, but discouragement was that this project of gravitational wave detection has been going on for a long time. The people who started it started it about 40, 45 years ago. The first thoughts were 55 years ago. So I joined 15 years ago. I'm a youngster in comparison. Um, uh, and when I joined, it wasn't a popular project in astronomy because astronomers didn't think that you would ever detect gravitational waves. It was a physics experiment, a physics curiosity. And all my mentors, most of my mentors, not all, um, told me, you're crazy to join this collaboration as a young astronomer. Um, and I did it anyway. I, in parallel, I did other things. So I kept, I diversified in my scientific <laughs> research. Uh, but I'm very glad I stuck with it. And why did I stuck with it? I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, stubborn, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Wendy or Angela, doesn't matter. Go ahead, you have the mic, Angela. Yeah, <laughs> so failures. Let's see. Well, first, the, you know, when are you ever going to finish? So my mother, when I finished uh, my PhD at MIT, she said, okay, great, now you're coming back and, you know, live ap happily ever after. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm going to a postdoc. And she said, what's that? Well, that's what you do after a PhD. Oh, come on, studying again? <laughs> so I said, well, actually, if I get it right, I will be studying until I die. And this is one of the things that I want to do, which is, you know, study like crazy. Actually, I'm looking at Kathy, and Kathy's always smiling at me saying, you never give up, right? Because, you know, obviously we have the Russian invasion, the, the uh, Fukushima yeah. disaster. So we had one disaster after another, but we won't give up, you know, because we know there's something at the end of the tunnel. There's an interesting question to be answered, and there's only one way, well, the way we could think of. We're doing the best way to answer that question. So that's what keeps you, you know, thinking again and redoing things. I mean, it does help to have tenure at the University of Chicago, you know, just in case. I'm also, you know, 
chairing the department, so they keep me busy enough on the everyday life with simple, you know, I think also diversifying not only in science, but also in your life, right? There are little things I can get accomplished, like, you know, hire the best young person to my department, like, fight with Vicky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we fight the best each other all the time. So, you know, getting you know, recruitment, keeping some of the stars we have, bringing Wendy to Chicago, I mean, all these great things that you feel good about while I'm trying to build the telescope. So, you know, you don't only do that because that's a bit uh, dry. But, you know, it's, it's a great life. Uh, but, you know, it, the other thing about failure is that there is the saying, which is true, both of us here are theorists, she's an observer, Observers and experimentalists have to get everything right all the time. The one time they fail, they are not credited. While theorists get yeah, things wrong. Look at the real universe. <laughs> right. So we get it wrong yeah. all the time. Let's not start that because we have three to one theorists to experimentalists. Yeah. So yeah. Wendy's in trouble. I mean, now I analyze data. It's yeah, I build telescopes. So anyway, but the point is that in theory, you're 99.999% of the time wrong because you're trying to explain something and you're writing some mathematical question. I mean, if you're studying things, you better be right. So we were all you know, a students, all that fun stuff. But once you become a researcher, and that's the part that's really difficult, is that you're never getting it right. Meaning there's always, you, you do a little better, a little better, but the actual answer is a tough one to get. And so failure is sort of part of research. If without failure, you don't do research. That's just, you know, textbook stuff, right? So research equals failure until you get it right. So, you know, you got to get used to it. Their ego goes a little smaller. <laughs> Thank you. When so, uh, so many things. Yeah, th lots of um, challenges to overcome. And I had I had supportive parents. I think we had that in common. But I had teachers in high school who would literally one of the physics teachers I had uh, would say to the class when he was describing something that was technical, the girls don't have to listen to this. He said, and. Um, when I got into university, by the way, I didn't listen to him. <laughs> when, when, I, when I got into university, uh, one of the students in my class, we were doing a, a, a physics project, and he said, uh, girls belong in the kitchen. And in another room in the house, I'll leave that one out. But um, that, and, and he got the C, I got the A. But, and that was, sweet for me because in the end he, they, so, but one of the messages I want to give, and I've seen this a lot as students progress and come up, women express doubt and it, it's, as student level, we all run into difficulties, all of us, first exams, whatever it is, but the guys that, and this is, I'm making a general statement, but it's, oh, the t something was wrong with the test, something's wrong with the prof, something's wrong with everybody. <laughs> but the women, say, and, and I can't tell you how many female students that had come into my office and postdocs and say, you know, it's me, I can't do it. And so if I give any message, it's everybody encounters these difficulties. But somehow women internalize it, I can't do it. And, and don't pay, to, you know, you have to, Stop that. It, it can help you work harder. That those are all good things, but don't give up. That that's a, a message I'd like to give the young people in the audience. I also had the experience. Um, we were getting ready for a big project on Hubble, a project that I led for about a decade, stuck with it. But the Challenger uh, it mm. accident happened and when the Hubble Space Telescope was about to be launched, and it was devastating for those of us that had uh, been anticipating the launch of Hubble. For me, personally, and who could have predicted this, I had two children in the meantime, and then Hubble got launched and repaired, and uh, things have a way of working out, even though sometimes they seem like they're devastating at the time. So perseverance is critical. Great, thank you so much. That's exactly why I wanted them to talk about this, because perseverance is the message, right? You just, you stick with it, you take a left turn when the world wants you to go left, you take a right one when it wants you to go right, you don't know why there's roadblocks in your way, but you just keep at it. And you have three great examples here of women who have really kept at it and are making a big difference.